Hi guys, welcome back. Thanks for joining me today. Firstly, apologies for not producing a video in a little while. I've um, been busy with a couple of family things, had a bit of illness as well, and I've also been sorting out a new computer so that I can uh, produce better videos and do them quicker as well, because my old laptop, it was taking, well, up to 24 hours to produce a video, and it wasn't doing it very well, as the previous video showed as well. So we had to uh, get rid of that and sort out a new desktop, so that's all good stuff. But guys, what we're going to look at then is something you've been asking for, which is the uh, carburetor, really. Um, and so we're going to be looking at, over the next couple of videos, the 539S uh, WO carburetor. Um, and this carburetor will cover, in this video we'll look at how it works and what it is, and then on the later videos we'll look into how to take it apart and how to reassemble it and get it working again, okay? So it should be quite a good, interesting set of videos to look through here, so I'd uh, keep your eyes peeled for that then. But uh, there it is, guys, that's the 539S in there. Firstly then, I reckon it's a good carburetor, okay? So it seems to work pretty well, um, it seems to give me the power that I need, the economy is not something that I worry too much about. I mean, it's an old Jeep. If you're worrying about economy, um, it's probably not the best vehicle for you. Most of you guys live in America where fuel is comparatively cheaper than it is elsewhere as well. So perhaps um, economy is a little bit more important for us, which is why rebuilding a carburetor and doing it correctly, or as correct as you can do, is quite important. Um, but I've seen, I think they work pretty well. You've seen in my videos me going up and down hills with them under load. Um, it uh, seems to provide the power that I want, and it's not too fiddly. It starts pretty easily. So really, I've got no reason to put anything else on there. I was once told by somebody that the Solex uh, carburetor made the Jeep a completely different beast and made it totally usable and a fantastic vehicle versus a piece of rubbish when it had the uh, WO on there. But I'm not too sure about that. I've never used a Solex um, and I'm quite happy with the WO, so I'm going to stick with it. Um, so I reckon, guys, the WO is a good carburetor to start with. So, you know, if you've got one, um, I reckon use it really and rebuilding it can perhaps turn it from being not fantastic into a, a really good carburetor. So that's what we're going to be doing then guys. So let's start having a look at a carburetor then and see how this thing works. A lot of the information uh, that I'm going to be doing here comes out of this book here which is the Carter Motor Tune-Up and Carburetor Service Instructions. This one's from 1947. They make various versions later and later. I got one which um, just covers the earlier carbs because the WO is obviously um, an earlier carburetor and the later ones have got more information which we don't need in there. But if you can get hold of one of these um, manuals that's fantastic. Um, they're on eBay quite a lot. They're not very expensive, so just grab one and the, the information in there is fantastic. We'll look at the images uh, which come out of that there and we'll run through them. So let's get down to it then. So guys, let's start off basic then. What have we got in the carburetor? Well, we've got a couple of components then. This is the top portion here. This is the air horn. This is where the uh, air comes in and this is where your choke choke lives in there and he sits in there with a big butterfly there and we'll look into these in more detail as we go on. But that is the air horn. Then we have the center section here which is the uh, bowl, so the fuel bowl. This is where most of the work goes on with most of the uh, drilled passages and uh, the little nozzles and things like that. They all live in here. But on top of the, the uh, fuel bowl, we have a uh, top cover. So there's a cover which lives in there. And then you can see the big fuel bowl where all the fuel sits. So this is the, uh, the body portion. And then we come down to the base, which is where the idle circuit lives as well. So we can see there's air holes drilled for uh, fuel air mixture to go down and more holes drilled in around here and uh, this is where your throttle butterfly lives. So the throttle uh, butterfly which controls the uh, amount of air entering the engine, that's where it lives in the base here, okay? So that's uh, the base. So those are the major components of the um, carburetor then and we will look into each piece as we go through the circuits with a little bit more detail. So guys, let's start off then with the low speed or the idle circuit. Ah, there you go, the uh, nozzles. Thanks for that, guys. Um, so this is uh, quite an important one. The manual reckons that this circuit works up to 20 miles an hour, and then it starts to hand over the, um, the brunt of carrying and the fuel down to the engine to the high speed circuit. So the low speed circuit isn't just for idle, although it's called a low speed or idle circuit. It also does some of the work uh, when you're moving as well. It reckons up to 20 to 30 miles an hour, which seems quite high to me, but there you go. So it's a very important circuit. And one of the other interesting things that it says about it is that this low speed jet here, this guy, this important little low speed jet, the hole in it is accurate to um, a quarter of a thousandth of an inch, which is not a huge amount, okay? So it reckons that you should never, if it's full of anything or gummed up, you should never um, stick anything in it and try and clean it out. You should only blow air into it, which of course for us guys is difficult because we've got old um, nozzles which look good like this one, 
but who knows um, how much oil lacquer and things like that are built up inside there. So only really deep cleaning is ever going to get that back to its uh, manufacturing tolerance. And you probably can't even get it back to its manufacturing tolerance of a quarter of a thousandth of an inch. You probably just have to replace it. So finding an accurate uh, car to master rebuild kit is probably the way forward there, guys. Maybe the reproduction rebuild kits can get accurate to a quarter of a thousandth of an inch, but um, I'm not sure about that. But the uh, the manual seems to reckon if it's not accurate to a quarter of a thousandth of an inch, then it's useless. So um, interesting one there, guys. But what we've got, um, let's just have a look at this then. So we've got our low speed jet and we've got our idle adjustment screw. Now, in the WO, they're slightly different to how they look here. The uh, idle adjustment screw comes down at an angle like that. And then the idle passage plug is here. That's where the copper rivet goes. And then inside it, can you see, um, this is the uh, opening port there, the idle port, the slot. And this is the uh, idle adjustment screw port there. I don't know if you guys can see those, but that's where they live. Okay, so that's what we're looking at with the base. And then the top, all that's, it's exactly the same. However, in this case on the WO, instead of the low speed jet being up like that, it actually comes down and screws in, okay? So it's 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 like that instead of like that, but it's identical, okay? Um, so what we've got then, guys, how does this work? So when the engine, let's start with the engine just cranking over. So it's not running yet, it's just cranking over. The throttle valve in the base, we talked about already, it lives inside there. The throttle valve is nearly, nearly closed, okay? And the engine is trying to draw in air, so it's creating a low pressure here. But there's also uh, a higher pressure atmospheric up here and there's atmospheric pressure in the fuel as well. And what we've got is a connection between comes in on the through the fuel bowl and through in the uh, the air horn as well, trying to go down to the base. So these are going to try and draw air or fuel down, aren't they? Because there's low pressure here. So what happens then is the fuel comes up. It comes through a drilled passage enters our low speed jet, which as we said in the uh, WO comes from above, whereas let's do it like this then. It uh, comes, yeah, let's put him like that. Stay there. Comes through the tiny little port there, comes up. Air is being drawn in here as well because they're at higher pressure and that air mixes with the fuel coming in here, okay? And it starts to aerate it and atomize it. So you're getting an air fuel mixture here. It goes through a tiny little passage there called an economizer, which uh, tries and sorts the ratio out. And then more air bleed comes in through here as well. So it's mixing fuel, uh, air into fuel here, and it's mixing air into fuel here to try and get it atomized and bubbly and all in the correct ratio. But it's still quite rich. So it comes down, it's being drawn down, and it enters our idle passage area, that little slit, okay? And it can be drawn in like that, and it can also be drawn in here. Now we have the idle adjustment screw in the base there, which we can screw in or out. If we screw it in, it stops, it reduces the amount of fuel air going in here. And if we screw it out, it increases the amount of fuel air going in. So it's quite straightforward, guys. So we've got a fixed slot there, which changes as the port, the um, throttle valve opens. It uncovers more of it and lets more of it out. You imagine if it's further up, more can flow down. So that's one way that the amount of air fuel is coming in but then we've got a fine tune adjustment on this idle adjustment screw which is the one we screw in and out and as you can see what we're saying is the low speed circuit doesn't just work at idle if this is the idle position here is the throttle butterfly just cracked a little bit as you open the throttle butterfly up more it just uncovers more of this slot so more of the uh, fuel is coming out through this idle circuit so the idle circuit doesn't just work at idle it also works up to they reckon 20 to 30 miles an hour, but I reckon that depends on the vehicle. Who knows with the Jeep? Maybe it's up to 10 miles or five miles an hour. I'm not sure, guys. Um, somebody will know out there, but unfortunately it's not me. Um, but uh, that's how it works, really. Quite straightforward. Fuel comes in, goes through metered jet, mixes with bypass air, goes through an economizer, which tries to limit the amount of fuel going through. More air is bled in, mixes with the fuel. You've got a fuel air mixture coming down here. Some of it can escape past the throttle butterfly into the low pressure there, but some of it can also go out to the idle adjustment screw, which we can then screw in and out to affect the uh, idle adjustment running, okay? Because you can see, once you start to uncover the port, once you start to uncover the port, this idle adjustment screw becomes less important. So once you start to go a couple of miles an hour, um, the idle adjustment screw has less effect because more fuel is coming out there. So that is the low speed circuit, guys. Hopefully that makes sense then. It's quite straightforward. Let's move on to the different circuits. Right, guys, then. Let's move on to the next one, which is the float circuit. Now, this is uh, 
quite simple bit, but it is very, very critical actually about how the high speed circuit runs. So um, weirdly enough, something so simple and overlooked is actually something really important about getting the mixture right in the um, Jeep and the carburetor, which is quite interesting really. So we can see in this image here what it looks like. We've got the top cover and this is sitting in the bowl, remember? So we've got, imagine the bowls on it. So that's sitting like that then. And then we have a uh, float which sits there. So we're doing it like that. He sits there. And then we have this um, needle seat is screwed into the top. And then you have a needle which sits inside it, okay, like that. And the needle goes up and down with the float. And this um, needle seats in the top of the, uh, well, the, the needle seat there. So when it's right at the top there, that blocks off the fuel coming in. So fuel's coming in here at the top. And when the needle is all the way up, so say the float is sitting high, it's pushed that needle up, no more fuel can come in. But as the float drops down, the needle can drop drop down and it comes out of its seat and fuel can flow in, okay? So that's the premise of it, it's very straightforward. It's just a little needle which gets pushed up and down by a float and allows fuel to come into the bowl or stops fuel coming into the bowl. Pretty straightforward really, isn't it guys? But it is a very critical uh, component in how the high speed circuit works, which is quite interesting really if you think about it, about um, the way that the fuel is controlled and the way that the high speed mixture is controlled is literally by a float and can be affected by gravity and the angle of how the Jeep is sitting. You know, if the Jeep is at an angle or something like that, the float can go up and down, which would affect the amount of fuel in the bowl. So it's quite a, quite a simple um, and straightforward device and premise, but it is not perfect in controlling the fuel. So that's it inside there. You can see what we said, there's the float, there's the seat, and the needle is inside there and it goes up and down. But if we have a look here then guys, we can see in these images, it's quite useful to um, bear in mind. I'll, I'll not use the images for what they're used for, but we'll look at it. So let's have a look, right. So this is the fuel level inside the, um, the bowl here, okay? So there's the fuel level. And you can see the fuel level lines up accurately with the top of the nozzle for the high speed circuit, which we'll look at in a second, okay? So there, that, that level is there. So if there's nothing drawing, there's no pressure sucking fuel out. If we're just sitting normally, no fuel, if it's at the correct level, right? When we set up the float, if it sits at the correct level, no fuel will flow out, so that's perfect, right? But obviously then, if we had the fuel, this, this uh, float was set too, uh, too low and it, um, the fuel level was sitting too low here, okay? So the fuel level was down here. You could see that the fuel level would sit down here in the nozzle. So when the low pressure is trying to draw fuel out, it has to suck it up the nozzle to get it out, okay? So it actually has to do a bit of extra work rather than the fuel level being just on the lip of the nozzle, just ready to pour out. If it's all the way down here, it has to be drawn out quite hard by the um, by the uh, the vacuum inside the um, throttle, uh, excuse me, inside the, um, the air horn, okay? So that would mean we have a lean mixture. So if your float is set up so that the fuel level is too low in the bowl, you get a lean mixture, okay? But conversely, if the float is set up so that the fuel bowl level is all the way up here, you could see that even with no vacuum, no suck or draw, drawing fuel out of the nozzle here, it would just simply siphon by gravity. So it would, um, it would be trying to come out of the nozzle even with no suck or draw. So that would be too rich a mixture. So amazingly, despite all this metering rod and all this clever stuff we have, if your f float level is incorrect when we come to it and we set it up in the future, if this float level is incorrect, it will either cause a too rich or a too lean mixture. So it's incredible when you think about it, that this little thing, which perhaps we don't overlook, you know, we just throw the float back in there and we don't care about it and we go, that'll be fine. It is absolutely critical that it sits at the correct height so that your fuel is just touching the lip of the nozzle, just ready to be drawn out. Um, so it's something which is not really, I don't think, thought about too much, but it is something really, really critical. And we can see what I mean as well about, you know, going up gradients and stuff like that. If you go up a gradient and the Jeep tilts, it's going to affect how that fuel level sits in here. So it'll affect the mixture as well. So this is why it's not a perfect system. This is why electronic control units and uh, systems which don't use float levels like this um, produce a better fuel air mixture ratio over varying different... Um, uh, conditions. So there we go guys, that is the float circuit. Very simple little thing, but very, very critical in how the high speed circuit works, which we'll come to in a second. But just bear that in mind then, that's the float circuit and that's allowing fuel to come into the bowl at the correct level, okay?
Okay guys, here's the next one then. This is the pump or accelerator circuit, and this is a clever little circuit then. So what we have in the Jeep is, we have attached to our foot pedal or accelerator pedal, we've got a connection to the uh, butterfly, the throttle butterfly in the base, which we've talked about, okay? And that has an instantaneous response. As soon as you move the accelerator pedal, the butterfly will open, okay? It happens straight away. But the problem is, that's a mechanical connection. What we're talking about is differences in pressures, aren't we, and things like that. And the problem with that is that there's a lag between the demand, the opening of the throttle butterfly, and when the fuel is supplied um, to the uh, intake from the carburetor, okay, there's, there's a lag just due to pressures and how long it takes a fuel to move around, inertia, things like that. So if I suddenly stamped on the accelerator pedal on the Jeep, the throttle butterfly would open, a lot of air could get into the engine, but the fuel is lagging behind, it's, it's got to wait for it. So what that means then is as soon as you stamp that throttle, instead of getting the power you're expecting, you suddenly get a lean condition and the engine will start to sputter and it, it will bog down. So if you've got a Jeep where you can, um, you stamp on the um, throttle pedal and it goes blah, and then it picks up, that's because the accelerator is not working. The accelerator pump uh, system or the um, circuit is not operating correctly because you're getting that bog down because it's suddenly starved of fuel. So the way they got over that, then, this then, guys, is we've got our fuel bowl full of fuel here and in the side we have this little area and we've got a, a pump a little pump who lives in there, this is a manky one, okay? And this is what we can see here, here's the pump, okay? And the pump, the top of it, is connected directly to the throttle butterfly, so any movement of the throttle butterfly instantly acts on the pump as well, okay? So you imagine this area is all full of, uh, full of fuel, okay? So if this was pushed all the way down at the bottom, there's, uh, there's no space left in here, okay? And the fuel is all in here. But if, you, if we let our foot off the accelerator, it would go up and that would create a vacuum, a space in here, which needs to be filled by something because this is sealed. We've got a leather seal here. Fuel can't come from above. It has to come from somewhere. So what it does then, in the bowl, it comes down, gets sucked in here, goes through that little screen. There's a check valve here, which allows it to come up and in, and then it fills this area up. So this area inside here, which is usually sealed away, down there, it gets filled full of fuel. So we've got a whole load of fuel in here, right? Ready to go, which is great. So when we're driving along, we suddenly hit our accelerator pedal. The pump, the pump plunger is pushed down. So that forces, that creates high pressure in here, which forces the fuel back out from where it's come from into here. Now this little valve here allows fuel to come in, but it doesn't allow it to go back down. So this area is blocked off now. So the fuel can't just blow straight back into the um, fuel bowl, which is good news. But the one up here we've got as well, this was seated previously when it was sucking in fuel, this wasn't allowing anything to come from above. But now we're pushing, we've got high pressure in here, it pushes this little ball off the seat and then the fuel can go up. So it can't go down, it can only go up. So it goes, gets blown up there, comes into here and then it comes out through our little pump jet. There's our pump jet and he lives inside uh, there. There's the pump jet, okay. And it sprays raw fuel straight out into the opening in the carburetor. So before the main circuit has had time to catch up with what the throttle butterfly is doing, we've just sprayed fuel straight into it so that instead of the engine going too lean when we suddenly hit the throttle and the butterfly opens, we suddenly supply instantaneously a load of fuel inside the carburetor to keep it rich, okay? So that's the uh, accelerator pump circuit. It's a nice straightforward circuit then. It provides instantaneous fuel when you need it and you'll certainly know when it's not working because you'll hit your accelerator and your engine will bog down and then it'll pick up again. So it's a clever little system really. As I said, it's got um, little check valves in there to make sure fuel flows in and goes the correct way depending on the pressure. And it also has a hole drilled in the side there to equalize the pressure between um, here and here so that when you're running, it doesn't just draw fuel. You know, if there's not the pressure coming from the, the, um, the plunger, if you're just running normally and there's a draw going on, it doesn't just draw fuel through it from the bowl all the time and create a rich mixture, it, it equalizes it so it only operates, it only allows fuel to go out when the plunger is doing the pushing and the, increasing the pressure, not just the pressure difference um, between the intake and the uh, fuel bowl. So a nice straightforward system there guys, but an important one to make sure that it works, and we'll come on to the rebuild with this, you can hear there's the little balls in there, they need to be moving and free obviously to operate and there's a spring on this one here, the check disc at the top, there's a spring in there, you can't hear it moving to make sure that the fuel doesn't flow the wrong way and flow out all the time, okay guys? 
So um, these are important little components here for an important system and they must be working. So we'll look at that when it comes to rebuilding it. So guys, let's move on then to the high speed circuit or the intermediate speed circuit, it calls it here, okay? So let's go back to the idle position. So when we're idle, we have this little guy here, the metering rod, which you guys know about. The metering rod sits in the bottom of the bowl here. There should be a seat he sits in there, okay? And that's what we're looking at here. Here's, this, here's where the seat would be and the metering rod sits in it. So it's like that. There's fuel all around it here, okay? And this area here is that bit there, the uh, output nozzle, okay? So you can see in there, that's where the, the fuel comes out of, okay? So when we're at idle, this uh, little needle has, or metering rod, has a gentle taper to it. It shows it as quite a, a, a pronounced taper here, but it, in reality, it's quite gentle on the Jeep, okay? So when we're at idle, this is seated right in the bottom of the seat there, and it's blocking off any fuel which was inside the bowl here being allowed into this circuit, okay? So this is at idle. So when it's doing this, no fuel can get through and this circuit can't operate. But the idle circuit is operating, which we know. So when you start to open the throttle valve though, the throttle valve is connected directly to a, uh, a lever here, which sits at the top here and will pulls up and down the metering rod. And we'll look at that later when it comes to rebuilding it, how that all works and everything. But as soon as you start to move it, it starts to move the metering rod up, okay? And if the metering rod is seated here, once we start to move it up, it suddenly unseats it. And now it looks like this. There's a little gap all the way around it where fuel can now flow into this area here. Now we know from the float level that the fuel wants to be, the level wants to go just to the tip here, okay? And if there was no difference in pressure, it would just sit at that level. No fuel would be drawn out. But as you start to open the throttle valve, the engine's drawing air in and it creates a low pressure inside here, okay? And then there's just atmospheric pressure from the fuel sitting inside the fuel bowl. And the atmospheric pressure is higher than the low pressure in here. So the fuel, when it's allowed to, wants to start flowing down, up, through the nozzle and get sprayed out into the mouth of the uh, carburetor and into the cylinders. So that's what's going on then when you start to unseat it. So as we accelerate, it starts to unseat, fuel comes through, goes down by pressure and it goes into the engine. Now the, the step and the shape of this is very specific and when you set it up, it has to be set up specifically so that you get the correct power or the correct fuel air mixture because this is controlling how much fuel can escape as, as well as the float level. As we said, remember if the, um, the fuel level's down here, you could have this in the correct position but the uh, engine's got to work, excuse me, the, the pressure differential's got to work harder to pour, pull that fuel out so it would go lean even though this is in the correct position here you know this is a, this is moved to the, allow the correct amount of fuel to it has to be the fuel level still has to be correct in the bowl uh, to reach the nozzle okay so we're seated start to open more fuel can come through more fuel can come through more fuel till, till we're going maximum you know we're at full chat and the uh, the the throttle, excuse me, the accelerator pedal is fully down and only the thinnest portion of the rod is left in the seat there and maximum fuel can flow through there. And that's how it controls the ratio of fuel and air um, at high speed with the high speed circuit. Now it reckons the high speed circuit starts to operate at 20, 20 miles an hour, okay? But um, as we said, this is for various vehicles and I'm not sure exactly how the high speed circuit is set up for the Jeep because it shows quite mark steps on there you know it suddenly cuts in but the, the jeep has a very gentle progressive taper so i think the high speed su circuit starts operating uh, much sooner than 20 miles an hour but that's just a that's just a guess guys i think it, it operates at a lower speed than this uh, manual seems to say but that's uh, all the high speed circuit is guys is a metering rod sitting in a seat at idle which is then pulled out of the seat unseats itself and allows fuel to be drawn from the bowl into the nozzle and down into the engine. And the specific taper on here controls the amount of fuel that it allows through, okay? So obviously setting up this metering rod and where it sits at idle and stuff makes all the difference because you could have, if you didn't set it up correctly, you could have it so that where it, the position it should be at 15 miles an hour, say, the, the fuel air ratio for 15 miles an hour, if you'd set up the rod height wrong, it could be all the way up here in the position it should be at for like 30 miles an hour, so you'd have a rich mixture. Or if you'd set it too low at 15 miles an hour, it could be set at the position you, you put it too low and it could be set at the position which is only allowing enough fuel through for five miles an hour. So that's why the metering rod height 
um, when it comes to it setting it up is, is quite important and there's multiple ways to set that up. But that is the high speed circuit there guys. It's controlled by a little metering rod sitting in a seat and the float, the fuel height in the uh, chamber due to the float. So there's two things working there together guys. So it's pretty straightforward that circuit there. But again, another thing which needs to be set up critically really and is very important. So we'll come on to looking at those later then guys. We'll start rebuilding the circuits. We'll show more of the the bits and bobs, cleaning up the uh, casings, how we're going to do that and everything. And um, we can get on to uh, producing a good carburetor. So stick along for that. I hope you enjoy it. Um, if you're not subscribed, click on the uh, little Jeep symbol in the bottom right hand corner to subscribe or click at some videos at the end uh, of this video as well down the side. And I'll see you next time, guys. Enjoy and good luck with your carburetors.